Hi everyone, welcome to yet another episode of Coffee Time with Mr. Yin. With your host, Mr. Yin, and today we're gonna have coffee. Tastes great. So recently I've got some requests from high school parents and they're approaching me, asking me questions about how to guide their students into AI education. So with that being said, I thought to use this episode as a nod to those parents who are interested in this field and hopefully I could address some of the important issues that deserve your attention. So I went online and did some research and I came across this website called AI for All and apparently it's founded by Dr. Fei Fei Li, which is a famous Stanford professor in computer vision and deep learning and she essentially started this program to really encourage young folks to get themselves into the field of AI. Now, when I say young, I'm not talking about undergrad. I'm talking about high school, middle school. Some even take this idea to go to kindergarten. Now, I'm from Shenzhen, so I know this company Tencent in Shenzhen is doing AI for kindergarten students. So in this episode, I want to especially address this issue, including the ups and downs, particularly regarding to teach young folks AI. So when it comes to this kind of issue, there are three factors that's extremely important that you want to discuss and think about. The first one is really about education inequality. So in the United States, you might hear people say, hey, there's a big difference in public school versus private school. And in China, since most of the schools are public school, then perhaps you hear people say, hey, there's a difference between public school and international school in China. And of course, going to a different school will have the implication that your kids will go on certain direction with higher chance. They're not gonna give you similar chance for all directions, you know? So right off the bat, I can tell you, in mainland China, especially the rural area, the chance that the kids even heard of the term AI is extremely low. Like we're talking about 0.001%. And yes, that sounds alarming. From what we're talking about today, everyone's doing data science, everyone's doing AI. That could be scary. But that doesn't really mean that this is a bad thing, you know? So right off the bat, we're talking about a scale that it's not strictly good and bad. It kind of depends on your own personal preference. But of course, is there inequality in education? Yes, especially in the field of AI. Like you look at the high school in Silicon Valley. All of their parents are software engineers, senior software engineers from Google and Facebook. So think about this. You're in a school and everybody learns coding at age five versus some other students who go to other public high school who maybe have not heard of AI, just doing your usual high school stuff, right? Like watching movies, smoking pot, and dropping out classes. Who do you think to have a bigger success of going to the field and become the next leader in artificial intelligence, right? You can do the math. And who do you think has a higher probability of going to a master program, going to grad school, and eventually be the director of artificial intelligence of some large company, right? So in other words, what I'm really trying to say is, even though it's not your choice, even though sometimes it's given to you, right? You don't have that many cards to deal with, the next 20, 30 years of how the world changes and who's going to dominate in the world is already determined in our education. So that's number one, the inequality. It's a big, big factor that I want to talk about. And when you address the ups and downs, you have to talk about that. The next factor is really about standardization. Now in private school, of course you pay more, right? Especially in the United States, private school are much more expensive than if you're going to public school. And hopefully they do things a little bit differently in private school, right? Maybe they have different science classes. Maybe they have different extra curriculum activities that can hopefully encourage you to think outside the box, that sort of thing, right? But that is not always guaranteed. So the second factor is actually highly correlated with the first factor. The second factor is really about standardization. But of course, you cannot have standardization if everybody is paying different money. So that's another thing that people want to address. Now in China, if you read the news, it seems like that is one of the agenda that people are trying to implement. So you might heard of a story like in China, extra curriculum are actually not allowed. And if you do that, government is going to shut you down, right? So on the surface, it seems like they're really just trying to address the standardization problem, right? Everyone has the same textbook. Everyone learns the same stuff. Seems like everyone's fair, right? But of course, you can't really control everyone. The rich people in China is going to pay to work around things. And of course, due to this issue, the second point unfortunately goes above to reinforce the first point. Which is why I thought this AI for All organization founded by Fei Fei Li, it's actually an interesting idea. 
because what that means is essentially everyone can learn about AI, hear about AI. If you go onto this website and treat it as extracurricular class, so hopefully you can essentially do a sweep of the blind spot. In Chinese literature, we have this terminology called sweeping your blind spot. So what that means is when you just get into the field, you kill off the terminologies first, right? You understand on a first name basis what each definition is, and then you take it from there. So if you're on the young side and you want to get into this field, I would say you can definitely start with one of these courses and just sweep out that blind spot and get an understanding of whether or not you like that. And then you take it from there, you let your imagination go, you let your passion go, and hopefully end of the day, you're really just chasing your passion and you're making your dream come true. And if you can develop an education path to serve that purpose, that's going to be a much more meaningful direction for you to execute. Instead of just chasing the grades, chasing the status quo, chasing all that boring stuff that you see on social media. And there's also a third thing I want to mention, which is related to QA, QC in the industry. So if you work in the industry, have a full-time job, chances are you've heard of QA, QC, quality assessment, quality control, right? In education, there's also a similar idea. And education is a product. A product is a service that you sell, right? The teacher stand on the stage, give a lecture, give you exercise, and then you work them out. The teacher is providing a service, the student is buying them. So in other words, this is a product. And when we talk about product, there's going to be quality control, quality assessment. So a key understanding here is, okay, what is quality assessment? Well, not all product in education has the same quality, right? So at Columbia University Teachers College, there's actually a master program of early education. And people actually go to school for much longer years after their undergraduate school, after their high school. And they're also going back to the field to teach kindergarten students Whereas in some locations, perhaps that job is done by high school graduates. So right off the bat, we're talking about a product that is not consistent quality across the board. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to argue that it's a large variance of the quality across the board. And this is especially true in even undergrad. No need to mention for high school, middle school, and kindergarten. Now, I know in China, there's a lot of variance, right? Uh, hopefully in the United States, that's more standardized. But of course, I did not do high school or middle school here, so you can argue that in the United States, it's probably a huge variance as well. So unfortunately, to tackle this kind of problem, just myself, it's definitely not enough, right? It's not nearly enough. You really need some sort of governor or the president, perhaps, to be aware of this problem. And that order needs to come from high above. And once we have that kind of leadership, and we can implement the QAQC for education across all the high school, across all the middle school, in the United States. And I've been teaching high school students as well, and I can tell you it's not as straightforward as it is. Sometimes it could be convoluted. Every high school agency I went to, since I don't do the marketing, I only teach, then whatever students come to the classroom, I have no control of, right? But you can say for sure that the students doesn't come an extremely poor family, right? Otherwise, they're not going to be able to afford the tuition. So in other words, right off the bat, these students are not randomly selected. Okay, it's not like randomly selected from a society. The students come from family that's already tailored by what? The tuition. So then, just like you're peeling the onion skin, the next thing that you look at is whether the student has passion. Sometimes the students come in because they truly are curious about the topic. Sometimes the students come in because their parents told them to, or because of status quo, because they want to go to a good university. Now, I prefer to work with students who are in this because of their own passion, hopefully you're not here because your parents told you so. So I'm addressing this because that affects the quality of the product, right? Think about this way. Student number one comes in and they have a particular interest. Doesn't have to be something superficial. Doesn't have to be something complicated, right? Does not have to be rocket science. I've had students come in here and say, look, I don't know anything about AI, but I'm interested in what is the number of goals the soccer team Arsenal is going to score next season. I said, great, that's a great data science project. You don't know data science, that's okay. We'll teach you that afterwards. But that's a great motivation. I like and I appreciate that this student has a motivation. Let's try to address that. Okay, so in order to know what is the number of goal that the soccer team is going to score next season, perhaps you need to understand how they're doing the season before. And it's even better if you understand two seasons before, three seasons before. And then on top of that, hopefully you understand how each player is playing. What does a forward situation look like? What does a midpoint situation look like? How about the goalkeepers, right? Is it home or is it away? 
these are great information to trigger the students to think outside of the box. Once they have that motivation, they come in here, they say, okay, this is the thesis. Let's go for it. And I say, great, you have the data, you have numbers, you have a question. That's awesome. Here's the model. Let me teach you neural networks. And neural networks can help you address these issues. That is a well-rounded project. Even though the students come into the classroom without any prior knowledge of what AI is. And that's how you get things started. The motivation has to come from students themselves. It cannot come from me, right? Think about it reversely. In an alternative universe, you come to the classroom and I'd be like, oh yeah, John Doe, today we're not going to talk about anything else. We're just going to be talking about soccer game. Your goal is simple. Your goal is to figure out who are the players in this team called Arsenal. And you need to collect data for that. So if I start a conversation this way, do you think you're going to like AI? Probably not. What if you're not interested in soccer game, right? I can't guarantee the students are all interested in soccer game, right? So in other words, to wrap up this third point, yes, the order needs to come from high above. That's the first layer of quality control that you're going to assess when it comes to this education product. And then afterwards, you need to address the student situation. Not everyone comes from the same background. Not everyone has the same motivation. And with different motivation, that unfortunately changes the quality of the education, even if the order is come from high above. So those two boxes have to check when you want to deliver a great education product to young folks. So hopefully this video provides you some important things to think about. And hopefully I made it transparent enough and easy enough to understand such that you can perhaps make some executive decisions for your kids if your kids are just entering into this field. And like always, if you have questions, shoot me a message on LinkedIn or leave a comment below. I'm happy to address it and talk about it separately. And I hope you like the video. If you do, give it a like and hit that subscribe button. And I'll see you in the next episode.